Gather around, children, gather around. I want to regale you with creepy automotive stories that might just send a chill up your spine. I've never told stories like these before, and well, what with it being October, I thought it was the perfect time to dip my toe into these waters. I'm going to be doing five weeks of this. This is the first week, so you have four more videos to look forward to. The first set of three videos are from Jalopnik. Link in the description down below if you want to read these stories for yourself and a few others. Now, without further delay, let's start with what is arguably the best of the bunch. This first story is called Bunny Man Bridge, written by user Beach Happy. About nine years ago, this time of year, my cousin from New Jersey was visiting me down here in Northern Virginia. She had heard my friend and I talking about going to a haunted house or something and she made it abundantly clear that she wanted no part in such endeavors. This, of course, made us want to find a way to scare her more, which led to the decision to drive her out to Bunny Man Bridge. My cousin had heard us talk about the infamous landmark before. She had heard the legends about the escaped convict who lived off of bunny carcasses decades before. Obviously, we couldn't tell her we were going there, so we lied and said there was a party out that way. The night could not have been more perfect. It was chilly, a little foggy, and there was no moon. We were in my mom's Hyundai Tucson and made it the 30 or so minute drive out to Fairfax Station to find the back roads leading to the bridge. The deeper we got into the woods, the thicker the fog became. My cousin, sitting behind me as I drove, was starting to get nervous. This place is really far. Do, do people actually live out here? Why is it so foggy? My friend and I could barely contain ourselves because we know what's coming. Just as we come around the bend before the bridge, we stop, leaving it in full view. The bridge and tunnel are illuminated by a lone, dim street lamp on the far side. My cousin sees it up ahead and stammers. Is... is... is that... is that Bunny Man Bridge? My friend and I laugh as my cousin starts hyperventilating. I let the car creep forward slowly until we reach the middle of the tunnel where I stop and put it in park. My cousin is freaking out at this point and we're on the verge of tears from laughing so hard. That's when crap went down. Out of nowhere, all of the car's electronics went down. Headlights, taillights, interior illumination, radio, everything. The entire car and everything around it went dark. My cousin thinks this is my doing and proceeds to slap me multiple times upside my head, all the while screaming bloody murder. I yell at her to stop and both me and my friend are freaking out because we have no idea what happened. The lights remained out for what seemed about 15 seconds when all of a sudden Everything lights up like a Christmas tree. All the dash warning lights and center console lights are on, and every single LCD screen inside the car is fogged up. Fogged up to the point where the radio readout was illegible. Despite the engine never dying, and the AC being on the defog setting the entire drive. I threw that crap into reverse so fast I thought I had broken the shifter. We hauled out of there, and to this day I can't explain what happened. The car was fairly new at that point, and to this day, has never had any kind of problem. My mom still daily drives it, in fact. My cousin still thinks it was part of the prank. It gives me chills thinking about it again. However, mission accomplished. My cousin did pee her pants a little bit. The second story is called Radiation Deer, written by Seth Ernst. My brother and I, him about 17, me, 16, decided to spend a late summer Saturday driving around and exploring a Georgia wildlife management area. The Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area, in fact. My brother was a deer hunter and wanted to check it out to see if he'd want to hunt there in the fall. We got a bit of a late start to the day and didn't end up leaving home in my dad's 89 Suburban until about 2 or 3 p.m. After the hour or so drive up to the WMA, we entered from the east side somewhere and proceeded to drive around on the gravel, mud, and dirt roads. Every now and then, we'd stop to get out to explore a bit. We did this for a few hours. Eventually, we found ourselves on a nicer, sandy road lined with pines. We could see a clearing up ahead. As we approached the clearing, 
we noticed a chain link fence off to the side. The fence surrounded a concrete building, obviously disused. The fence was eight feet high with barbed wire on the top. Curious. Not wanting to get out of the truck, my brother drove through the shallow ditch and approached the fence. Up ahead, we could see a sign was hanging on the fence. As we approached, we realized that the sign had a radiation symbol on it, and very strong warning about it being U.S. government property, no trespassing, etc. We had no idea what it was, but we didn't want to stick around to find out, especially since we jumped the ditch and were driving right against the fence. My brother decided to turn around and get the heck out of there. That's when he goosed it. The back end slid around and into the fence. Oops. We got the hell out of there as quick as possible. Being a bit spooked, and as it was getting into evening, we decided it was probably time to head home. Driving back the way we came, we must have missed a turn. It got dark as we still wandered around. Finally, the road turned to asphalt. Brand new, black as night asphalt with brand new lines, center and shoulder. Interesting. Finally, thinking we were getting back to civilization with smooth asphalt, an SBC under the hood, and being a 17-year-old, my brother floored it. We got up to about 80 miles per hour or so when we rounded a curve and spotted glowing eyeballs up ahead. I exclaimed, DEAR, just as he started applying the brakes. It was a long ways off and we had plenty of time to slow. As we approached at a reasonable 20 miles per hour, the deer stood stock still in the middle of the road looking back at us. When we got within 50 yards of it, my brother honked the horn briefly and flashed the lights, hoping to get it moving. It did move, but directly at us. As my brother came to a stop, it trotted right up to the front of the Suburban and proceeded to lay its head on the hood, still looking directly at the windshield. My brother tooted the horn. It didn't move. My brother revved the engine. It didn't move. What the mess. That isn't normal deer behavior. Finally having enough, he threw it in reverse and started backing up. The deer followed. He laid on the horn hard and finally the deer realized it was a deer and bolted into the woods. My brother put it back in drive and took off now at a more reasonable pace. 200 feet down the road, the asphalt ended and we were back on dirt. We'd just driven about three miles in the middle of nowhere on brand new, freshly striped asphalt which connected to no other road. It wasn't until much later in life when I was to return to the area to visit family that I did some research. It turns out that the Dawson Force WMA inhabits a parcel of land which was once the Georgia Nuclear Aircraft Laboratory. The area had an open-air nuclear reactor which was housed in that building we'd stumbled upon. From the Wikipedia link above, the site was used for irradiating military equipment as well as the forest to determine the effect of nuclear war and its effects on wildlife. Perhaps the deer was a nuclear mutant Perhaps it was warning us of the end of the asphalt, which would have ended badly at 80 miles per hour. I don't know, but that trip up to Dawson Forest is the spookiest memory I have in my 40 years. This story is called Trucks Can Sense the Bad Juju, written by user Morgan. A truck and a girl. Right off the bat, the story has potential for me being the bad guy. Still, sometimes the hints are there and I never see the jealousy. Let me elaborate. I was dating a girl about 12 years ago who, to be honest, was not the most intelligent decision I had ever made. The year prior to her, however, I had purchased a far more loyal lady in my life, my 1983 W150 Dodge Power Ram. The moment I started dating the girl, let's call her the crazy, my solid and reliable truck started being a pill. Fuel delivery issues, dead batteries, blown U-joints, little things that could be attributed to just things caused by age and a need for maintenance, right? Still didn't get the clue when six dates in a row, the truck quit in protest. Not going well. By now, my friends were telling me the crazy was bad news and I still wasn't listening. Sucker in love or some crap like that. Anyway, a month into the relationship, October. A bunch of friends have a scary movie marathon with food and drinks and all that. My friend and the crazy go take my truck, 
who doesn't want to start, etc., etc. One of the movies was Christine, the Plymouth of Doom. The crazy decides that she does not want to be there, and we end up leaving early. The crossroads at the intersection make an X instead of a T, and I had to make a really sharp leaning turn to the left, making the truck lean heavily to the passenger side. Remember this. At the start of the turn, the crazy, still complaining about the movie with the killer car, suddenly says something along the lines of, you should jump this junk truck before it kills you too. It is at this moment that, while entering the turn, the carburetor sticks wide open, making that slant six engine redline and roar, and the rear tires shred around the corner. The truck heels over like a ship in a storm, and the passenger door opens. Scary, especially considering that the seatbelt suddenly released at the same time, sending the crazy pitching head first toward the woefully uncushioned asphalt. The crazy has her cowgirl belt to thank for saving her, as I was able to grab only that to prevent the girl from tumbling out to doom. All while I was struggling to control a truck that was bucking like a dang horse. Once the truck straightened out, the door swung closed and the throttle released and the RPMs dropped, thus giving me control. My truck had straight up tried to Christine my crazy ex. The relationship ended shortly after that. The moment it did, the truck ran like a seamless watch. I still have that truck. If you enjoyed those wheel trembling stories, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe, hitting the little notification bell, then all notifications, that way you'll be notified every time I upload. I do so hope you enjoyed, I'll see you all next time.